Hello and welcome to the podcast that teaches you the things your parents and teachers are too afraid to, the Helios blog. Today, Jordan Peterson and Douglas Murray, they talk about truth as an antidote to suffering. Let's get into it. The reason she's alone is because she's difficult. Women are not accepting the bare minimum. Women fuck men they respect. All the women who say things like, I'm strong, independent, I don't need no man, like, y'all impress me. Women just gaslight each other and say what they want to hear. You know, it's so funny because one of the reasons that my lectures have become popular is because I have done that for young men, yeah. right? And I, and suggest to them, yeah. well, if you're miserable, it's possible it's because you're useless and you're not doing what you should be Absolutely. doing. And you, you, you could think perversely and should think likely that why in the world would that possibly be a saleable message? Right, exactly. Because it's not... Um lovey-dovey, happy-go-lucky, everything is fine, you don't need to do anything, which is what the West teaches. You know, and the answer is, well, if the person that you're addressing is genu genuinely miserable and hopeless, and you say, well, maybe there's something that you're not doing quite right, mm -hmm. then they now have an avenue of movement forward. Yes. Right? They it have efficacy, they have the ability to improve. If you say instead, well, it's no wonder you're miserable because the cosmos yes. and the patriarchy yeah. are structured such that you're yeah. you're an, you're an, a victim of circumstance yes. without recourse. I, ha I had this recent. I was on a program the other day where um, there was a, a, um, a black British woman on who claimed to have suffered hurt from slavery, and I, 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 I'm fed up with that claim mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. uh, I said, I was, you've not suffered anything. You haven't suffered any hurt. And no one alive has caused you the hurt. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, a lot of people will say, who are you to say that? You're just a, another privileged white guy or something. Mm -hmm. But I actually think it's necessary to say that to people because, uh, actually, as Clarence Thomas points out in his recent Supreme Court mm -hmm. judgment mm -hmm. on affirmative action, um, if you don't get that out of the way, the rest of history is going to be a competitive grievance competition. Mm -hmm. and right, exactly. That's effectively what I've said in my previous episodes, right? And also it takes a very narrow view of history, right? Uh, because throughout history, many, many groups have been the oppressor and not just the British Empire or whatever. And so you actually need people to say, no, I, I'm not I, I'm not falling for this. You may have fallen for it. You may have decided right. that everything in your life would be sorted out if reparations were paid to you by the state of california i'm not convinced that would help you mm -hmm. i think you'd have a fantastic shopping binge for a few days and be as un unpleasant and unhappy a week from tuesday as you are right. today mm -hmm. and precisely um, but but the, but it's it's very striking that there's something missing in 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 our societies of people saying that of just saying you know when yeah because telling the truth is you know you want people to be mindless consumers. You don't want people to actually take the steps to fix themselves, cure themselves, help themselves. Because if you do that, then, well, society becomes strong. And if they're strong, then they don't just buy whatever you tell them to on TV. Not going along with your self-perception. And that's on so many things. We're not going along with your, with your self-perception and agreeing to it, not just because it's bad for you, but it's bad for all of us. It's bad, yeah, it's bad for them and for all of us simultaneously. Yeah. And you know that, one of the things I've been really shocked by, I would say, with regard to my fellow therapists, is their absolute cowardice, and almost universally so, I, on the self-identity. Yeah. I assume cowardice on behalf of almost everybody. So. I don't yeah. expect heroism in our age. It's it's wonderful when it happens, but you should. Assume I, but I think I think it's particularly egregious on the therapeutic front with regard to self identity. Yeah. Because every so here's here's two things that every psychologist who's actually trained knows, if if they are worthy of the name. The first is identity is negotiated yeah. by anyone who isn't two, like literally, yes. yeah. by three. You negotiate your identity. And if the whole, the definition of being a civilized person 
is that you negotiate your identity and you do it yeah. constantly. Yeah. I mean, you and I sitting here mm -hmm. in open dialogue are negotiating our identities, right? Because sure. we're attempting to modify the manner in which we perceive ourselves and present ourselves as a consequence of exchanging information. We couldn't even talk. Well, of course, the people who push the self-identity mantra also claim that there's no such thing as free speech, right? There's there's no honest exchange of ideas between men of, of good faith, let's say. Why not? Why could that not be the case? Oh, because everything is tainted by identity politics, that's why? <clears throat> everything that a person says must have an agenda that doesn't sound like uh real life that sounds like a political message right hey or yeah. goodwill so so that's one thing psychologists know and they absolutely know this and part of what you do as a psychologist if you have any sense at all is you teach people how to negotiate their identity more effectively right and so the second thing this like boundaries psychologists know is that you expose people voluntarily to the things that frighten them yes. instead of protecting them. Right, because if you, if you always um, clear the way for a person, then they have no way of navigating the world themselves. Which, I mean, if you're looking to create a sheep, right, a person that doesn't do anything for themselves, they just listen to whatever you say, then you would snowplow them, right? You would you'd move all of their obstacles out of the way for them, and what's, what's the point of that? Well, the point of that is once you move everything out of the way, they have no efficacy. They can't affect change in their own life without external help. And so they're effectively your puppet. And at that point, when they're your puppet, then they can, you can steer their life whichever direction you want. Usually that's through programmed messages in the media, right? Yeah. you know in this trigger warning fashion and yeah, yeah, yeah. all psychologists know that 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 kind of over what that overprotective attitude is definitely a pathway yeah. to psychopathology oh by the way please tell me if the um, volume issues are fixed with this video uh people were telling me that jordan's videos uh his sound is a bit too low and mine is a bit too high so i've turned it down like you guys suggested tell me if it's okay for these videos and yet no one will stand up and say that. It's, it's, uh, it's, I, I have a habit, which I learned from a late friend who was a journalist, uh, 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 which I've tried to stick with throughout my adult life, of always going to one dangerous country a year. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I do it for lots of reasons. One is just curiosity of the world. Uh, another, I suppose, is that it, it is one of, to go back to what we were saying earlier, one of the best ways to actually feel a sense of gratitude about where you're from and what the good right, things right, are in right. your society because yes, yeah, yes. unless you've seen a society at war um you don't understand quite how blessed how how bad it can actually be state pieces i mean um uh and how easily what happens to other people could happen to you um but there are other reasons to do it and what a miracle it is that that isn't happening all the time everywhere absolutely like it used to be because yeah, well, that's the that's the state of nature. That was right. Is, yes, absolutely. I mean, um, that's one of the things that Pink has right on in the blank slate is uh, deaths in tribal societies pre modernity, uh, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. way higher. The the uh, violent violent deaths way higher even than the average violent deaths of a European male in the twentieth century. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so right, right, right. Um, so yes, to some extent, this is this is a, a natural state, but. Well, big surprise, right? When you don't have police uh, beating down a person that tries to, you know, bully, intimidate, and control another person through physicality. Big surprise that it happens, right? Not everybody has such, um, you know, qualms about, uh, you know, controlling themselves unless the state is the one that says, no, no. You can't do that, and if you do, there are severe consequences for it. I, I also do it just partly because I, I, I learn so much about the, about how societies deteriorate, um, and uh, and as a as a as a sort of very very minimal final thing, you, you always find out something about yourself. It's it's never the purpose of doing it, but there is well something well, you find well, out. Well, okay, so so here's know. here's a very interesting clinical finding um, 
It was a revolutionary discovery in the 50s, 50s, that's about right. So the psychoanalysts following Freud would walk people through what they wanted to avoid, and they did that autobiographically, right, by going back into the past. And there's some utility in that. The behaviorists came along, and what they did instead was expose people to what they were afraid of here and now. So what behaviorists say is the mind doesn't exist. All that matters is behavior, right? And behavior can be modified, and um, your choices are what determine how you end up effectively. So, for example, if you were afraid of balloons, which is rare but does happen upon occasion, um, a therapist would sit you down, have you relax, run you through a relaxation exercise, maybe show you a picture of a balloon, ask you to imagine it, then put a balloon, you know, 15 feet away and then 10 feet away and eight feet away and then a balloon on your lap and maybe that takes a number of sessions mm -hmm. and then the fear would disappear. Mm -hmm. Now, the theory was the reason the fear disappeared was because you paired the exposure with relaxation. Right. Okay, but then it was discovered that you didn't have to pair it with relaxation and it still worked. Okay, you then, could be in a hyper. You could be in a sort of hyper as long as you're doing, aware state. As long as you're doing it voluntarily. Interesting. You have to do it voluntarily. So you have to expose yourself to the danger, to the risk, and be willing to be exposed to it. I mean, that would be the pathway to build resilience towards anything, right? Interesting. Right. Okay. So then, the psychoanalysts' rejoinder to the behaviorists was. Um, you know, the, the person isn't really afraid of a balloon or an elevator. They're really afraid of death. And if you eradicate the specific fear, it will just move locale because you're not dealing with the root cause. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, that also turned out to be wrong because what happened is if you exposed people to, say, three things they were afraid of, they would go out voluntarily, voluntarily and expose themselves to all sorts of other things that they were afraid of. So you didn't make them less afraid. You, you actually made them more brave you made them braver right. which is very different yeah right and so yes. what you did with exposure therapy was what it was that you transformed people's mm -hmm. conceptualizations of themselves you transformed their mm -hmm. conceptualization of themselves from passive victim of yeah. malevolent circumstances to i can face my fears i'm able to conquer the things that that terrify me to active contender with challenge uh, seriously, maybe I've been doing, uh, maybe I've been do um, unwittingly doing this to myself all my life. Um, I remember the first time I, I was covering a conflict, uh, and there were rockets landing, and it, it was as it actually is. It's quite exhilarating if to, if you if you're in a. It isn't if you have no choice to be there. But mm -hmm. if you're a war correspondent, or something it's famously a problem of the job so that you can find it exactly well that's that dis well yeah because the 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 artillery is not pointed at you even though it could hit you it's not the conflict actually isn't with you and so uh it's fun right oh people could be hurt people could die you know it also disconnects you from caring about the suffering of these people too Distinction between voluntary and involuntary, Absolutely. too. And, and uh, Winston Churchill famously said, there's no greater feeling uh, than the feeling of being shot at without result. Um, it's an enlivening uh, uh, enlivening uh, thing that you feel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You think, not today, death, not today. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, Lord. <laughs> anyway, that's um, a very easy way to... Uh... That's a very easy way to convince young people to go and do it. Not a good idea. Um, and um, but the first time I was ever in a in a conflict where there were rockets landing, I, funnily enough, when I got back from the area where it was happening, and got back on the first evening, my immediate instinct was a very strange one to me, which I thought about a lot afterwards. Which was that I thought I could look my grandparents in the face. I see. So he became very brave he became brash like i've dealt with things that are more difficult than than this so who cares now what i mean by that is that i'm all my grandparents are long dead by them but what i meant was 
they'd all gone through the Blitz or the Second World War. Right. Um, and I'd always wondered how on earth you coped with that. And I suddenly sort of thought, oh, I see, it's like that. So I would it's... say what you did, okay, so there's a mythological tone to all of the things that you just related. So the first thing you said was that perhaps you had been doing this unwittingly in some sense your whole life. Well, one of the things that psychologists eventually figured out was that, well, people are unwittingly doing this their whole life because that's how you learn. Yeah, right. You expose yourself to the dangers. You put the mushroom in your mouth and you see what happens. And when you don't, you know, uh, violently explode, uh, then you learn. Of course, mushrooms are a bad example because certain mushrooms, you feel fine and die three days later. But, you know. Yes. The way you learn is by mm. facing an optimized challenge yes. voluntarily. And that pushes you slightly beyond yeah, your yeah. current limits. Now, right. that's the, that's where meaning emerges. Right. Right. That's So meaning is the instinct that puts you on the edge of transformation. Yes. We and think so, I'm, I'm going to learn something from this. Yes. you're yeah. gonna, and, and you may learn something about the world or where you are in the world, but you may also learn something mm. about yourself mm. or change as a yeah. consequence, yeah, right? Yeah. And so Absolutely. the instinct of meaning actually puts you on the, it puts you on the edge of chaos. Okay, but the grandfather, so, so that's the heroic path, by the way. Mm. But the grandfather comment's extremely interesting too, the grandparent, because one of the tropes, mythological trope, is that if you go into the belly of the beast, you can yeah. rescue your forefathers from the belly of the beast. That's Pinocchio in the whale. Sure. Well, that's what you did in some ways when you... I think I just wanted to know if I, would, if I could sort of stand... If, if you could do what brave people have done, if you could handle yourself in such a situation or if you're actually a coward fundamentally it's a test of your own character uh i i just always thought that that generation the heroism what they went through right i just thought you know you always have that thing of what would one do in that situation how would one behave you know um and there's and even just getting the smallest glimpse of Okay, I think I could hold it together. Well, that, that means that yeah. you you kindled that inside you. Mm -hmm. The spirit that you saw in your grandparents that you admired, you kindled inside by mm -hmm. that exposure. And you said that brought you to a position of, you know, not yeah. full equivalence, but at least partial equivalence, yes. right? Well, so here's part of what happens. So if you expose yourself to optimized challenge. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, you gather more information. So these countries you went to, eh? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're learning about the countries, you're learning about yourself. That's pure information. But here's something else that happens. This is so cool. So if you put yourself in a new situation, new genes turn on inside you and they activate parts of you that have not yet come alive. So the point is, um, the more you face, the better you become. You actually evolve yourself through your own actions. You change. You are no longer the same person you were before, but in a literal sense. Very interesting. Yes. Right, right. Yes. No kidding. So then you might say, so there's, there's a... Yeah. There's a maze at Chartres Cathedral. I think it's at Chartres. And the, there's an idea in the maze. So you enter one side of the maze. It's about 40 feet across. And then you have to walk every quadrant, northwest, south, and northeast, south, and west, every quadrant. And if you've walked every quadrant, you get to the center. And the center is also the center of the cross, right? So that's the place of maximal suffering. But mm -hmm. there's an idea there. And, and redemption, there's an idea there. And the idea is that if you go absolutely everywhere, mm -hmm. every bit of you will yeah. turn on, right? And so, and a fair bit of that is, yes. right, right, exactly. Yes. And, and well, and you know this, we know this is true. And you think, well, how could it be any other Very way, true. right? Because, yeah. and you know too, these experiences that you had where you're voluntarily confronting what's dangerous, mm -hmm. that changes you in a way that can't be attained by anyone who hasn't had that experience, right? right? If you haven't pushed yourself yes. to your limit, yeah. especially I would say with regard to the fear of death, mm. then you there's a change that hasn't occurred within you. And I would say it's a fundamental change of maturation. Mm. So it's definitely, I mean, it's definitely an enormously enlivening uh, feeling, uh, I would say. Um, and uh, 
So what what do you think was at the core of the enlivening element of it? I mean, you said it well, was partly having cheated death, but that's yes. but that's not all it is, right? Because you also, I, I had a client who was terrified of death enough to dose herself with sleeping pills constantly to be unconscious. And she had a dream. And in her dream, the figure she saw was a dwarf in a forest told her that unless she could learn to work in a slaughterhouse, she wouldn't be able to graduate from university. Wow. And so so we we wow. talked this dream through and I said, well, I don't think I can arrange to have you visit a slaughterhouse. She wouldn't eat meat, by the way, and she couldn't go into a butcher store. Wow. So I said, I don't, I can't get you into a slaughterhouse, but maybe you could think of something that you could do that um, would be equivalent. Why don't you think about it for a week? And so she came back and said, I think I'd like to see an embalming. So I called up some furniture, funeral Furniture, that's funny. <clears throat> well, I mean, they are dead. So kind of, I guess, like furniture in the sense that they're inanimate. But anyway, uh, that was that was funny. But interesting. Parlor directors, like right then and there. And I said, I have this client who's terrified of death. You guys deal with death all the time. She has this sense that if she came and saw embalming, that it might be helpful to her. And we'd also like to talk to you about how the hell you do this because you face death every day and like she can't face it at all. And so, and they were- You get used to it. Very, very understanding and just said yes. And so we went there two weeks later. I'm very squeamish about that sort of thing as mm. well, you know, about, about that kind of gross physicality, let's say. And so it wasn't something that you know, I would just wrap off as if it was sure. nothing. But she, my client was absolutely terrified, but it was so interesting. And this is part of the enlivening element. So we were in the hallway, separated from the surgical room, so to speak, where the embalming was taking place, which is a very visceral occurrence as you, all the bodily fluids drain, for example. And, yeah. and for the first, first of all, she went to the funeral parlor. Second, she sat in the hallway Third, when it first started, she was looking to the side, eh? But she'd do this. Mm. And then That's every time she common. did that, she'd look a little longer yeah. until finally she was watching it completely. And then... So she was brave to do it. She said, you know, can I go in the room? Can I put my hand on the body? They put her on a glove and she did that, you know? And now what happened to her, and this was so interesting because she had a lot of neurotic concerns and part of them reflected her own sense of her own weakness. She came out of that knowing that she was a lot less weak than she thought, because she could do it, well, right? Indeed. She didn't think she was that sort of creature, and it turned out that she was that sort of creature. Right, um, I've heard that uh, guys that, you know, fight as well, it's a similar thing, right? Like, um, fighters feel the same way. That uh, you didn't think you were that kind of guy, then you put yourself in the situation, and I mean, it turns out you actually are. Sure, and quite quickly. That's the learning that about yourself. Yeah, I mean, is to, uh, so to be encouraged. So to be encouraged, because the first thing that happens, I'm struck by your example. That the first thing that happens is looking away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's that's the most natural of instincts, and we all have it. I mean, you'd have to be have something slightly wrong not to. Uh, but to train yourself to be able to look at the thing that that terrifies you, whether it's death or something ugly, um, is uh, it seems to me, at any rate, that it's it's one of the uh, one of the things that drives me is that if you look at enough, and as long as you don't tip over into the void. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If you look at enough, you can get to that place of stillness. Mm -hmm. um, there's an, uh, a metaphor that's always on my mind from the end of Evelyn Waugh's Decline and Fall, where a very curious man who's uh, an architect in the book and a rather minor figure is, is at the very end, of, when, when it's been the whole plot, but at the very end, after all the terrible things have happened to various people and the human comedy of the whole disaster of the novel, uh, the one of the main characters sees this architect, this mysterious figure sitting, um, uh, watching this fairground ride. And the fairground ride is one where uh, uh, this this thing spins round 
and there's a net around the outside and people pay a shilling and they go on, they try to climb up the side and they're flung to the sides all the time. And I think his name is Miss Dr. Silenus is just watching this as all the people. And he says how, how, um, how, how loud they laugh and how they cackle and how they get flung around mm. and how they sounds like how children play. And they all try to get to the top. And he says, occasionally the circus pays for somebody who knows how to do it to get to the top and sit there. And he says, that's where you want to be because at the top, in the center, it's totally still. That's, there's no centrifugal force there. Okay, so I have, I have a, I'm curious about something. You. We run as hard as we can just to stay in the same place. That's from Alice in Wonderland. You made a comment earlier about the fact that your more natural presumption now is to assume that cowardice will be the order of the day. Yes. Okay, so there's something about you that's always struck me. And, like, I've met a lot of people over the last six years, particularly, and I've met a lot of people who have remained silent when they shouldn't, and I've met a few people who will speak, but mm -hmm. they're rare. Mm -hmm. You know, I probably met 50 or 100 now mm -hmm. who will speak, and you're one of them. Mm -hmm. And Ian Hersey Lee is another one, right? And there are these people who, J Jonathan Haidt is another one, right? They don't remain silent. No. And so now you talked about a pattern through your life of going farther and going places that challenged you. Yeah. like, And you talked about the fact that you have seen cowardice as the order of the day, especially. Well, yeah, I mean, read any book, right? Any book that's seriously about the world, and you'll see that cowardice is the order of the day, and it's very hard to be brave. Brave is something that most people only see in fantasy. Okay, let's end the video there. Hit the like, hit the sub, hit all the notifications, drop me a donation like Hunter M, Adrian Otom, and Bobby Dillon, Renaissance Press, and Brian, shout out to you, most recent Patreon subscriber. Thank you. My Patreon can be found at patreon.com slash the blog. You can buy my books at bit.ly slash Helios Books. If you're interested in coaching, message me at the Helios blog at gmail.com. I'll slot you right in. Thank you so much for listening, guys, especially if you listen to the end. Take care of yourselves, and I'll see you next time.